to summarize how to prevent disruptive modes of thought, perhaps especially among those who administer it, since they take it too, and quote, how to prevent the absorption in one's own thought processes from creating social withdrawal, insensitivity, impulsivity, and an unrealistic sense of omniscience. So it's, um, it's important to learn from our critics. And I think that there's a lot to be said here for um, how we can make it in a successful way, to, to take advantage of the fact that we are now showing that psilocybin can produce mystical experiences that people say is one of the most important experiences of their lives, that we can help with post-traumatic stress disorder and that we can help people face death with a little bit more peace to it. So that we have incredible things to offer to this society. Um, to give you an example in a way of the, um, the MDMA post-traumatic stress disorder study, we had two veterans from Iraq who were in the study who had post-traumatic stress disorder from the war. The VA was not able to help them. The VA didn't even want them to be in the study. We had to do a lot of struggle to find vets and go around the VA. But we were finally able to do that, and these guys are now doing much, much better. We had a woman who was on disability for 20 years after her husband went berserk and tried to kill the kids, tried to kill her and committed suicide in front of them. She hasn't been able to work for 20 years. After three sessions of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, she has now gone back to work. Now, I'm not saying it works like this with everybody, but I'm saying that we have some really remarkable stories of healing that are compelling and that I think that we can use them both to attract the permissions that we need all over the world and also the resources that we need to do these studies. We're in a camp to provide psychedelic emergency services. So we're trying to show that people that end up with difficult experiences, if you work with them in a sensitive way and you give of yourself an enormous amount of time, sometimes a whole day, sometimes 12 hours, that you can actually help people move through these difficult states and end up learning something from it, often going back to the party, you know, wiser and sobered up a bit, but that we can take these casualties and really minimize them and really help people to, to grow from these difficult experiences. So two people came to us um, who'd heard about the work we were doing and they were both interested in doing MDMA, but they wanted people to sit with them uh, one person had been raped at Burning Man four years ago, and another person had post-traumatic stress disorder from 9-11. The last five years, we have been looking for somebody that had post-traumatic stress disorder from 9-11. Again, I mean, as uh, Neil told you, my degree is in public policy. So this is, my work is this combination of politics and science, and also art, the art of therapy which is as much an art as the um, art that we've been uh, fortunate enough to watch and observe earlier today. So that there is this ability to communicate to larger groups by picking sort of diseases that people are compassionate about, post-traumatic stress disorder, diseases that everybody will have, anxiety about dying, and so also trying to find somebody from 9-11. So at Burning Man, there they were. And these people were able to make incredible progress. And to be able to see that firsthand, it's been very inspiring to me to, it's not just a theory, it's not just data, it's not just numbers, it's not just a study, it's, it's like real human lives and real richness is coming out through this engagement with their problems. So that we have, um, I've been inspired and, and that's helped me to say, okay, I'll give up with the five year $5 million plan and I'll acknowledge that it's going to take a little bit longer. But I think that's, that's really a healthy process to, to really acknowledge that. And I think for those of us who are parents, you know, you, you think about your children and they're little kids and before you know it, they're off to college. So a 10 year plan, a 20 year plan is really not that much. That's one of the benefits of aging is your sense of time uh, changes. And while time gets more and more precious, it also gets easier and easier to think in longer periods of time. So what is it that we have to do to make MDMA into a prescription medicine? Where we're at now is what's called the phase two process. And this is where you develop your method, you see how uh, strong your effect is. You, you're basically planning for what's called the phase three studies. So at the phase three level, 
we're going to probably need about uh, two studies, about 300 people in each one. And we're going to need about 15 or so therapy teams. Our model is male-female co-therapist teams. Came from Stan Groff, and it's just has worked out really, really well. So I think this, this balance of masculine and feminine works as a, a co-therapist team. It's tremendous. And it's expensive, though, too, because you got two therapists, not just one. And it's roughly 40 hours of therapy in a four-month process for two different therapists. So it's 80 hours of therapy. So if it's even $100 an hour, it's $8,000 just for the therapy. So this is not as cheap as giving somebody a prescription for Zoloft or Paxil, but it's attempting to reach down to a cure rather than to just work on symptom relief. So that what we have to do is refine our method and we're now having teams, we're spending about $25,000 just for several teams to watch the videotapes of the therapy sessions and try to develop a training program that doesn't involve drugs where we would offer this to these uh, male-female co-therapist teams. We also have to have operationalize this treatment manual so that blind independent raters, blinded independent raters can observe videotapes of therapy sessions. They won't know whether they're MDMA or placebo sessions, but they have to score the therapists on how well do they comply to the method. So, you know, we are talking about the art of therapy, but now we're talking about the science of it and getting it extremely rigid and very controlled. So we have to make sure that there's the same kind of therapeutic method that's being used in uh, 20 or 30 different locations. So now we're working on that. And we also believe, now, a lot of this was about the concerns at Harvard that Leary and the bunch were uh, taking the drugs themselves. And it, it's possible to take the drugs too often, but it's also possible to take them not often enough. So it's our view that a therapist would be better if they have tried MDMA themselves. Not that everybody who takes MDMA as a therapist would be better than every other therapist. There's all this individual variability in therapeutic skill, but it's our view that just the same way that a meditation teacher wouldn't teach meditation without having learned how to meditate, that psychoanalysis, if you want to practice it, you have to have your own psychoanalysis. There's loads of examples of like this. But our challenge is going to be to get permission from the FDA to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. And we're not going to require it. We have to watch out about this accusation that we're sort of building a cult, that, we're, that everybody who does this therapy must do these drugs. So the MDMA portion of it, if we get permission for it, is going to be optional. The non-drug portion is the main thing, and we still, though, the best way to think about MAPS is as a nonprofit psychedelic and medical marijuana pharmaceutical company. And our, our role model is actually uh, women's reproductive health is the development of the abortion pill RU-486. That was so controversial that no pharmaceutical company would take it on. And so Planned Parenthood worked with the Population Council and they developed a nonprofit that got multi-millions donated from Warren Buffett and they, they did this development and they made RU-46 into a prescription medicine. So that it's not a unique model that we're trying to advocate here. And in fact, the Bill Gates Foundation is now supporting a lot of nonprofit drug development. But those are usually drugs for diseases for poor people in Africa. They've put in over $100 million into nonprofit drug development. The psychedelics are not patentable. They're in the public domain. Their use is not patentable because we've talked about all the different uses, so you can't get a use patent. And these drugs, when they're used in our method, they're only used a few times. They're not used every day. So that it's not a, a profitable model from the pharmaceutical industry. And the governments aren't going to give money now, and the big foundations aren't either because it's too controversial. So it's falling to our community to produce all of this data and act like we're a pharmaceutical company. And so we're having more and more people from the mainstream uh, pharmaceutical companies. In fact, the, the irony for me is that uh, a woman from Novartis, now Novartis is the company that bought up Sandoz, which is where Albert Hoffman worked. So now we have somebody from Novartis who monitors clinical trials, has trained our staff on how to do clinical research monitoring, which is extremely expensive. And we have other 